Pets aren't just like family, they are family. So when you need to find a sitter for your furry baby, go to care.com slash pets. It's easy and fast to find local, experienced, and background-checked pet caregivers. From dog walkers to cat sitters, there's long or short-term care options at Care. Whether you need pet sitting or boarding, you have options to choose from. Visit care.com slash pets and browse by availability, rating, see reviews, and more to find the ideal care for your pet care needs. You can even post a job for pet caregivers to apply to. And rest assured, all caregivers who you can interact with are required to complete a background check. You can even find other kinds of care, including child care, housekeepers, caregivers for seniors, and more. Find care for all you love at CARE. Go to care.com slash pets now and see why over 3 million households use this amazing platform. Find a caregiver your furry family will love at care.com slash pets. That's care.com slash pets. In three, two, one. Seven things you don't really need to know, but probably should. I'm Jamie East, and this, this is the Sunday Sun. On today's episode, there's a stark warning about climate change, we get a lesson in farming from ants, and Rolls Royce heads to the moon. But first, it was on this day 1976 that Queen Elizabeth II sent out the first royal email from the Royal Signals and Radar Establishment. The climate time bomb is ticking. UN Secretary Antonio Guterres says there's little time to lose in tackling climate change and rich countries need to slash emissions sooner. His latest call came in a recorded address after a new assessment from scientists. Humanity is on thin ice and that ice is melting fast. As today's report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, details, Humans are responsible for virtually all global heating over the last 200 years. Guterres says the panel's latest report should be seen as a survival guide for humanity. He urged developed countries to commit to reaching net zero emissions by the earlier date of around 2040. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, emission must be halved by the mid-2030s if the world's to have any chance of limiting temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. That's a key target in the 2015 Paris Accord. But average temperatures have already spiked more than a degree, fueling more extreme weather events worldwide. Current estimates say the planet could warm by more than three degrees by the end of the century, and just meeting existing pledges may not cut it. As the panel's chair, Ho Sung Lee, puts it, We are walking when we should be sprinting. Nations are expected to update climate pledges by 2025, and this latest assessment will serve as a guide. The panel says if there's any chance of making the necessary emission cuts, the world needs to transform agriculture and eating habits and speed up the transition to green energy. Rolls-Royce has just received funding to build a nuclear reactor for a base on the moon. It might sound like the setup of a James Bond film, but this is in fact part of a very real-world project that aims to see humans living and working on the lunar surface. The UK Space Agency has given Rolls-Royce £2.9 million to construct the reactor, which could one day provide nuclear power to support a full-time moon base. It's a very small reactor that we can absolutely launch into space, so it's about the size of a car, and it allows us to give continuous energy and electricity either on space or on Earth. This is Abby Clayton, Director of Future Programmes for Rolls-Royce. It absolutely allows people to live on the moon, to think around you know, what sort of little village you might want to create, and given that there's no oxygen there, you've got to be able to create oxygen, water for people to live on, heating, lighting, and then you've probably got things like rovers or, or machines that you want to use on the moon's surface, and they'll need charging with something during sunlight hours, and when you've got the sun, you can use solar. But if you want to explore the dark side of the moon uh, and go around the other side, actually you're going to need something else. So the, the nuclear power allows you to do that. The micro-reactor can be used similarly on Earth as it can in space, so to provide off-grid power effectively. So we may beef the units up to, to provide a little bit more power, but if you find, kind of think around mobile power units uh, to be able to remove diesel generators, for example, and that really starts to lower the carbon footprint and gives us a more sustainable future. This won't be the first time the UK space agencies work with Rolls-Royce. They even funded a quarter of a million pound study last year. The UK space agencies supported us actually quite a long time. 
time. So we, we started off some very low feasibility studies with them a, a couple of years ago, and we've gradually built that into more of a concept as we go through to the point now where uh, the UK Space Agency are supporting us in, in building some of those demonstrators to start proving the technology of various aspects of that reactor plant. The UK space environment is kind of growing quite a lot. Um, you know, here at the Leicester Space Park, we've got a whole hub of activity here around academia. And we're starting to reach out into the universities as well, University of Bangor, uh, Loughborough and Oxford. And it's not necessarily just about space, but it's the technologies that allow that to happen. There's material science, uh, nuclear materials uh, or manufacturing. We've got a lot of the manufacturing research centres involved as well. So it all comes as a hub together from the whole UK. Currently, Rolls-Royce hopes the micro-reactor will go to the moon in 2029. Still to come on the Sunday 7, dizzy apes and plastic-induced diseases. Five. Scientists have discovered a new disease in seabirds that eat plastic. Every day around 8 million pieces of plastic spew into the world's oceans and much of that ends up in the guts of seabirds. These birds have got scarred digestive tracts, a phenomenon that scientists at the Natural History Museum in London have named plasticosis. In collaboration with other researchers, they studied flesh-footed shearwater birds from Australia's Lord Howe Island. The island's 600 kilometres off the coast of Australia and birds of all ages were found to have scarred digestive tracts from ingesting plastic. This is Australian biologist Dr Jack Orty. We found that the most birds had plastic inside their gut and that that plastic was inducing inflammation and fibrosis. So fibrosis is a build-up of tough scar tissue in their stomach and that would really hinder the function of that stomach. We find these birds washed up on the beach because they don't have the right feathers, they don't have the body weight, they don't have any ability uh, to take flight because they're so full of plastic. The study is the first to look in depth at the formation of scar tissue from plastic ingestion. While the research focused on flesh-footed shearwaters, more than 1,200 marine species are known to inject plastic. Hayley Charlton Howard's a marine biologist and as she puts it... This species is really the canary in the coal mine for, you know, any plastic related scar tissue that may be also happening to these other species. It's likely been caused in any animal that's being exposed to plastic, including us. So we may be grossly underestimating how much damage plastic is doing to wildlife and doing to our health. From merry-go-rounds and carousels to just simply spinning around on the spot, kids love to make themselves dizzy. And it turns out apes love it too. Researchers have found that great apes deliberately spin themselves in order to make themselves dizzy. And they think these findings could provide clues about the role of altered mental states for origins of the human mind. The research was carried out by academics at the universities of Warwick and Birmingham and say that the human trait of seeking altered states is so universal that it raises the intriguing possibility that this is something that's been potentially inherited from our evolutionary ancestors. To find out more, we spoke to Dr Adriano Lemera, Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Warwick, who co-led the study. Thanks for joining us, Adriano. So, how on earth did this line of research come about? Actually, I just came across some videos of this huge gorilla spinning in a swimming pool. I believe it's in the Dallas Zoo. And what struck me on the one hand was how conspicuously different spinning was from anything else that they do in their repertoire. Are, and at the same time, how similar it was to the behavior that we all know and have engaged at some point in our lives. And of course, by experience, we know that spinning has very utility, if any at all. And so this was really a flag, kind of a giveaway for us that maybe great apes were also purposely spinning to get the, the head rush and in, in search for this momentary feel of elation. And so what we did was we compared the spinning behavior of great apes with human world traditions that also include rotation and spinning behavior. So ballet pirouettes, traditional dance pirouettes, circus acts, surfy whirling. And what we found was that great apes were spinning as fast as professional human performers who go 
over extensive training and dedicated uh, training to avert the the nauseous and, and more negative be, uh, effects of spinning. And indeed, they were um, spinning as fast as Sufi Sufi dervishes who who whirl on purpose to seek this trance like state um, as part of their you know spiritual practice. And so, you know, really indicated to us that orangutans were, if they were spinning at these speeds, they were as well um, going through these uh, deviating states of awakened awareness, uh, just as we do, even if just momentarily they were purposely seeking those states. And ultimately, what were your findings? Why do you think apes make themselves dizzy deliberately? I think it's the same reason that drives children to do it. I think they are bored for the lack of a, a very scientifically charged word. I think um, a lot of our observations came from captivity. We had some in the wild, but in captivity, in comparison to the wild, great apes have, uh, you know, they lack a similar level of stimulation, which is just kind of obvious. And zoos do their utmost best for enriching them physically and socially, but there's just so much you can offer when, you know, when you have to keep animals in an enclosure. This is completely different for great apes in the wild that they have extensive territories. So I think they are trying to kind of self-arouse themselves, kind of seek a, a, a rush, have a better time than what they are having. So what are the implications for humans and humanity then? Does it tell us anything about why we like spinning around too? Children are in touch with these behaviours. They instinctively, almost independently, continuously rediscover these behaviours. And now we find that all great ape species are doing it. And so a conclusion is that our ancestors were certainly doing it as well. And so it really speaks to built-in bodily mechanisms, natural behaviors that we are that we have deep-seated in our biology and behavior that have allowed since our ancestors individuals to modulate their their mood, try to kind of change their situation, kind of self-generate stimulation uh, voluntarily. And I think it's it's interesting uh, because it's a completely different way of addressing well-being and mental health in alternative to substance use or substance induced type of states or medication. Here, on the other hand, we have kind of autonomous behaviors that we can all engage in at the step of a finger and that perhaps may offer the same benefits but with a lot of more control yeah you lose control if you spin but it, that's exactly that elation that brings you the benefit but after it you know you're good to go so to speak what are your next steps i would be very curious to kind of i don't know make a, a global survey of whether the behavior is present across cultures i, I predict so i think it would it if, if we are kind of finding it in all great apes and we kind of all know intuitively that children spin, I would find fascinating to find that, you know, indigenous tribes somewhere would also spin or, you know, people living in complete different continents, um, children uh, would also spin. I think it would be wonderful and kind of help us not only build a more clear idea of what could be the role of these mechanisms in in our biology, in our behavior, uh, but kind of also then start opening more and more kind of a brand new window of how we think of uh, human modern behavior, mental well-being. I think it would be fascinating. Still to come on the Sunday 7, chat GPT's upgrade and a huge weed problem's heading to Florida right after this. Pets aren't just like family, they are family. So when you need to find a sitter for your furry baby, go to care.com slash pets. It's easy and fast to find local, experienced, and background-checked pet caregivers. From dog walkers to cat sitters, there's long or short-term care options at Care. Whether you need pet sitting or boarding, you have options to choose from. Visit care.com slash pets and browse by availability, ratings, see reviews, and more to find the ideal care for your pet care needs. You can even post a job for pet caregivers to apply to. And rest assured, all caregivers who you can interact with are required to complete a background check. You can even find other kinds of care, including child care, housekeepers, caregivers for seniors, and more. Find care for all you love at CARE. Go to care.com slash pets now and see why over 3 million households use this amazing platform. 
Find a caregiver your furry family will love at care.com slash pets. That's care.com slash pets. You're listening to the Sunday 7. Follow us for your weekday news espresso or even try our island edition. It's in all the usual places. If you visit the tropical forests of Central and South America, you might be lucky enough to spot a parade of leafcutter ants tirelessly carrying food back to their nests. But did you know they're not carrying those leaves back for food? Ants actually can't survive on plant material, so instead they use those leaves to feed the gardens of fungi that they grow on their colonies as their primary source of food. You may have had an ant farm as a kid, but the ants are the real farmers. Whilst humans have been farming for about 10,000 years, the ancestors of ants have beaten them, well, you know, by about 60 million years, and they've gotten pretty blooming good at it too. This is bacteriologist Cameron Curry from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. They have uh, formed massive colonies composed of... uh, potentially as many as uh, 5 to 10 million workers, and they can defoliate a mature eucalyptus tree overnight. The ant foragers carry their cargo down into the nest and turn it over to smaller worker ants. They clean the fragments and chew them into a pulpy mulch. The leafcutter ants are then able to cultivate a fungus that breaks down the toxins in the leaves and swells with proteins and sugars. This is the ant's food. And as biologist Ulrich Mueller explains, both the ants and fungus need each other. Both the ants and the cultivated fungus are dependent on each other for living. The ants need the fungus as a food. They're dependent on it. You take away the fungus, they will die. In reverse, the fungus cannot do without the ants. So it's a mutual codependency. In order to maintain this harmonious relationship, the ants constantly groom their fungus gardens to get rid of any disease-causing or parasitic fungi. And they also grow a type of bacteria on their bodies that's known for producing many of the antibiotics we use. Humans have been using antibiotics for about 100 years or so, and we've huge problems now with antimicrobial resistance. Ants, on the other hand, have been using antibiotics for possibly 50 or 60 million years and have no problem with resistance at all. So how on earth do they do that? Matt Hutchins is a professor of molecular microbiology and he thinks it's all to do with how they're using their homegrown antibiotics. So we think what they do is they recruit lots of different antibiotic-producing bacteria and they use a mixture of antibiotics. And we know that in human medicine, if you use a mixture of antibiotics at the same time, it slows the evolution of resistance. So it's much harder for bacteria to become resistant to three antibiotics at the same time compared to just one antibiotic. Now, scientists from the University of East Anglia are taking a leaf out of the ant's book to develop new antibiotics for humans. We've discovered some very interesting molecules, including a new class of antibiotics called formicomycins. So formicai means ant. Um, So these formicomycins are very potent against so-called superbugs like methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA, and vancomycin-resistant enterococci. And the most important thing for us is that we find the bacteria, the pathogenic disease-causing bacteria, don't become resistant to these antibiotics. It probably costs between half a billion and a billion dollars to get an antibiotic from this stage uh, to the clinic. And it takes probably 15 or 20 years. But without antibiotics, of course, everybody is going to start dying from drug-resistant infections. And it's estimated that by 2050, 10 million people a year around the world will die from drug-resistant infections. And now we know that we need to be very careful with these medicines because they're life-saving. And without them, we're going to be in big trouble. So what we want to do in the future is have better antibiotic stewardship. So we use the next generation of antibiotics much more wisely. These little guys really put the ant in antibiotics. I apologise. GPT-4 takes what you prompt it with and just runs with it. From one perspective, it's a tool, a thing you can use to get useful tasks done in language. From another perspective, it's a system that can make dreams, thoughts, ideas flourish in text in front of you. ChatGPT is upgraded for a fourth time since its birth in November 2022. ChatGPT 3 could write poems, solve problems and summarise texts, but there were concerns about its accuracy. With GPT-4, those kinks have been fixed and this version can even understand pictures. GPT-4 is incredibly advanced and sophisticated. It can take in and generate up to 25,000 words of text. 
around eight times more than ChatGPT. It understands images and can express logical ideas about them. One user showed the chatbot a picture of their fridge and asked what to make for dinner. Spotting the yogurt and strawberries, ChatGPT suggested a parfait. Blimey. It can translate, calculate and code, but tech experts admit that this raw intelligence is a double-edged sword in the wrong hands. This is AI expert Dr. Gary Marcus speaking with CNN. Part of the concern is that bad actors will deliberately use these things to misinform people. So it's one thing to have fun with Tom Cruise and, and mm -hmm. make up having him say something wacky, but you can imagine troll farms in other countries trying to influence our elections. Mm -hmm. And my single biggest fear is that, is that people are going to try to disrupt this democracy by making an atmosphere where we can't really trust anything. You can make millions or billions of pieces of misinformation a day with whatever your own alternative set of facts are. It's incredibly plausible. It has references and data and so forth. It looks really real. And most humans aren't going to be able to tell the difference. And so a lot of people are going to be fooled. Right. And a lot of people are going to feel like they can't trust anything. And this is actually a concern shared with the chatbot's founder. Here's OpenAI CEO Sam Altman speaking with ABC News. One thing I'm particularly worried about is that these models uh, could be used for... Uh, large-scale disinformation. I am worried that these systems, now that they're getting better at writing computer code, could be used for offensive cyber attacks. Um, and we're trying to talk about this. I think society needs time to adapt. We, we've got to be cautious here. And, and also, I, I think it doesn't work to do all this in a lab. You've got to get these products out into the world. And, and make contact with reality, make our mistakes while the stakes are low. And how confident is the CEO that what he's built won't lead to those negative outcomes? Putting these systems out now, while the stakes are fairly low, learning as much as we can, and feeding that into the future systems we create, uh, that tight feedback loop that we run, I think is how we avoid the more dangerous scenarios. The fourth iteration of ChatGPT has only been out for a few short weeks, but already there are significant concerns about privacy. A glitch allowed some users to see the titles of other users' conversations. Sam said the company feels awful about that and that the significant error has now been fixed. The company's privacy policy does say that user data such as prompts and responses may be used to continue training the model, but that data is only used after that personally identifiable information has been removed. The blunder also comes just a day after Google unveiled its own chatbot, Bard, to a group of beta testers and journalists. Google and Microsoft, which is a major investor in OpenAI, have been jostling for control of the burgeoning market. But the pace of new product updates and releases has many concerned that missteps like these could be harmful or have unintended consequences. One. This sounds just like science fiction. A 5,000 mile long belt of seaweed weighing more than 11 million tonnes is currently sloshing around in the Atlantic Ocean. Right now it's on course to reach the southern US state of Florida and when it does it threatens to wreak havoc on the coastal waters and beaches. It's called the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt and it's so big it can be seen from space spanning the tropical Atlantic from West Africa to the Caribbean. The Great Sargassum Belt is a new population of sargassum that seems to have developed since about 2011. Uh, we had, didn't see it there in satellite imagery before that, and then we saw this explosion of a popula new population about then that seems to basically slosh back and forth between the coast of West Africa and the Yucatan uh, Mexican coast on the other side of the Caribbean on an annual basis. This is oceanographer Ajit Subramaniam explaining the phenomenon on PBS NewsHour. Large patches of seaweed in this part of the world isn't new. It's actually where the Sargasso Sea gets its name from. But since 2011, the seaweed's been growing, and it's been growing fast. Ajit says there are two main theories. Uh, one has to do with the change in circulation and a deep mixing, which brought nutrients to the surface in 2010. That seems to, that could have initiated this new population. The other theory is that it is changes in agricultural or land use patterns in the Amazon River Basin that has increased the uh, flow of nutrients coming out of the river. Um, I personally think that both may be partially right, but I do not know that either one explains it completely. So for me, it is still a little bit of a mystery as to what caused the new population. But it is obvious it is there, and it has been growing since. These large patches of seaweed can be a habitat for fish, and it's a very active ecosystem, but there are also threats as it gets closer to land. When it washes up on beaches and in Barbados, I've seen uh, piles of sargassum five feet high, and you do not want to go to the beach when it is uh, covered with sargassum. 
both because it really smells very badly when it rots. Um, but then people have now done studies to show that pregnant women are affected by the hydrogen sulfide that is produced due to the rotting of this, I guess. Methane is produced when it rots. Um, and that is a very potent greenhouse gas. You also have environmental damage because um, while in the process of cleaning up sargassum, you have heavy trucks going on the beach and, uh, and uh, damaging the rather delicate environment that a, a beach is, um, there is in increased erosion when uh, sargassum is washing up on the beaches and gets washed away. It's been suggested that hatching turtles uh, uh, have a difficult time climbing their way through the mass of sargassum that has beached, and therefore it might be uh, affecting turtle populations. So, what's the solution? I have been working with colleagues. Uh, we've, we've been working on this idea that if we can collect the sargassum when it is still in deep water offshore and sink it, then we are actually coming up with a nature-based solution, basically mitigating against climate change, because um, when the sargassum grow, they do photosynthesis, which basically means they take up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and convert it into biomass. And if you sink the biomass to depths greater than maybe 2,000 meters, you are taking the carbon dioxide out of circulation for about 100 years from the atmosphere. This has been the Sunday 7. Wherever you're listening, do us a favour and hit the follow button. We'll be back tomorrow at 7am with the regular Smart 7. Have a great rest of your weekend. Written, produced and published by Daft Doris.